Hi, everyone. If you told me a couple years ago that I'd be introducing a Veterans on Wall Street panel about an expedition to the South Pole, I would have said, you know what? That sounds about right. I'm not surprised because it is just like our amazing Bob Woodruff Foundation partners to lead the way, push boundaries, and go places few people dare to venture. I'm Anne-Marie Doherty, the CEO of the Bob Woodruff Foundation. Together, BWF and VOWS bring together industry leaders to achieve two shared goals. One is attracting, hiring, and retaining veteran talent. And two, making sure veterans and their families have everything they need to thrive at work and at home. I'm excited to share that we're expanding our horizons to reach other industries beyond financial services, partnering with our friends at Way Up to bring veterans' strengths to Wall Street, Main Street, and everywhere in between, including places as far flung as the South Pole. That brings me to today's panel. In partnership with BWF Grantee and one of my favorite organizations, Move United, legendary polar explorer and founder of the 2041 Ant Foundation, Robert whole team of veterans on an Antarctic expedition. Team Undaunted, as they, as they are now called, includes Marine combat veteran Sunny Lee and Army combat veterans Alana Duffy, Cameron Kerr, and Shonda Mofu. And our very own Bob Woodruff plans to join the expedition to document this extraordinary journey of resilience and strength. Their journey is sure to inspire global conversations about strength, resilience, diversity, and the environment. I for one, can't wait to follow along. And with that, I will very good friends, one of the co-founders of Veterans on Wall Street, the unstoppable Chris Perkins. Chris is a Marine combat veteran and managing director at City. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Anne-Marie. And ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Perkins. I'm one of the founders of VOWS. VALS was formed in 2009 so that firms could share best practices in a non-competitive manner to advance and empower military veterans and their spouses as they transition. Since its inception, we've raised over $15 million for various veterans organizations, including the Bob Woodard Foundation, and we've trained thousands of veterans and hiring managers on the value of our demographic. Throughout the pandemic, we've hosted a series of events focused on the very appropriate theme of resiliency. Today, we have a very special treat that will feature my friend, Robert Swan, the first person in history to walk to the North and South Poles, along with members of the Undaunted team, including military veterans, Lana Duffy, Chanda Mofu, Cameron Kerr, and Sonny Lee, who are planning an expedition to the South Pole in January. I think you will find these stories of resiliency captivating. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my dear friend, Robert. Mr. Swan? Robert, you're on mute, sir. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us all today. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a story about how this all came together. And it's just really a story about hope, by the way, and doing what you say you're gonna do. And this began for me when I was 11, uh, last time I had hair and properly dressed. And I saw a film about the real explorers who went to the North and South Poles. And I said, one day I will become the first person to walk to both poles. And everybody laughed at me and they still laugh at me. But guess what? In between, we achieved those missions. And if you imagine, uh, oh God, sorry, bloody phones. Um, I apologize. Um, yeah, after years and years and years of fundraising, we found ourselves, three of us, standing on the edge of the Antarctic uh, continent. And basically, we were about to undertake a journey that everybody said could never be done. And we had no radios. They didn't exist. We had no GPS. It didn't exist. And we would navigate to one building, the South Pole Scientific Station, using the sun, a sextant, and this old watch. 
Uh, so really, there's no way out. If things go badly, if things turn against us, um, we can't ring up Mummy for help. So this would be the longest unassisted march ever made on the planet. I would lose 69 pounds in 70 days. It gives you some idea. It was reasonably hard work. We cross crevasses. If you fall in, you don't come out. And we learnt things that people in the military know all about. And that's actually trust and um, real trust, not half trust, real trust. And we came through that. And as we closed in on the South Pole, you're in an area the size of the United States of America. And the fact that you're the only people there, a bit lonely, no one in that area, except 90% of the world's ice beneath our feet, 70% uh, of the world's fresh water, we're standing on it. And as we would start to realize that, you know, if we continue to melt this, which we are, uh, I think we'll have to take some swimming lessons here on planet Earth. 90% of the world's ice, 16,000 feet of ice beneath our feet. And the last few miles to the pole, they live in my nightmares. You know, if we'd made one mistake, a couple of minutes wrong on our watch, that would have been it. We would have missed the South Pole and two days left of food and that would have been it. But I was with some incredible people, absolutely outstanding people. Uh, Roger and Gareth navigated us only 300 yards off course in 900 miles, an incredible moment. And we stood at the pole and, you know, we were very proud of what we'd achieved, not just us three, but the whole team. And it was a great moment. Something happened to me walking to the pole. And to be honest with you, I'd never thought at all about sustainability, the environment. None of those words existed. But something happened to me walking to the South Pole that kind of brought me here to speak to you all today. And my eyes changed colour in 70 days through damage. Our faces blistered off and we didn't know why. And when we came home, we were told by NASA that we'd walked under the hole in the ozone layer. It was discovered while we were walking and the ultraviolet rays had come through the hole, uh, fried off our faces and uh, burnt out our eyes. And it started me thinking that maybe our survival on this planet might not be somebody else's problem. But first, the dream. First, we had to reach the North Pole. The South Pole is ice on land. The North Pole is a frozen ocean of ice. So every step you take to the North Pole is away from the safety of land across a frozen sea. Very hard, physical, engaging work to the North Pole, very rough terrain. This would be our home uh, for 56 nights in a row, eight of us from seven different nations. We had to learn patience and check out Daryl on the right, who would come from Harlem, New York City. He would become the first American to walk to the North Pole. Uh, but you can see in this picture how much he truly loved Rupert's music. Not much. We had to learn patience. Here's me coming in uh, naked after washing my body at minus 65. And you will notice clearly two things. One is that if anybody ever says to you, I am cold, if their face looks like this, they are cold. And secondly, gentlemen watching, you will notice there is nothing at all hanging down in the central area. This is extremely cold. We are now 642 miles away from the safety of land. And again, this is before satellite phones, before uh, GPS, uh, and literally in three days, the nightmare begins. The ice starts to move beneath our feet, and four days later, the entire Arctic Ocean melts beneath our feet. And this photo was taken in April. It was supposed to look like this in August, so this was unplanned. And this is way before people had talked about climate change and all those things. We just thought, great, we're dead because in 20 hours of trying to go north through this, we're still drifting south. So basically it's game over. 
But to stay alive, we cheat time and run 40 hour days, which you can do at the North Pole because it's always daylight in summer. A huge battle lies ahead now. Uh, the team start to get under very difficult circumstances. Daryl, our brave American, he lost his heel through frostbite only. Um, 115 out from the pole, but we hold it together. We get a bit of luck. The ice comes together and we stand at last at 90 degrees north. The job was done and it wasn't me that did it. It was we that did it. And I thought it was important to fly a flag, which I still think is relevant on our planet Earth. And I went back home and my patron for these expeditions was a gentleman by the name of Jacques Cousteau. You might remember his name, a man of the ocean. And he said to me, Rob, you've reached the poles now. Will you take on a 50 year mission? I said, OK, why not? And 30 years ago, uh, he gave me this 50 year mission that in the year 2041, the treaties, the arrangements that preserve Antarctica for us all. Right now, we all own Antarctica. No one can touch it. But in 20 years from now, that treaty could be altered, changed, thrown away. And Antarctica is our last chance on Earth just to leave one place alone as a natural reserve land for science and peace. I, I think it's a good mission. And to do that, we've involved thousands of young and old leaders like myself to go down to Antarctica. A lot of people coming from the Middle East, a lot of people coming from India, a lot of people coming from China. And you know, these great nations like India and China hopefully will become important to decide on the future of Antarctica in 20 years from now. And what we see there, ladies and gentlemen, is I don't use the word devastating lightly, but devastating. Huge areas of Antarctica breaking off, masses of amount of extra ice in the water, and I see it every year. So I see the changes. And even NASA um, have got in on the deal with incredible photogra photographs from space, showing us that these huge areas, that area at the bottom there in the color, that's the size of Texas. The top one's the size of France. These are massive areas of ice. And if you melt an ice shelf, it doesn't really matter because the ice is already in the water, like putting an ice cube in a glass. Once it melts, the level doesn't go up. But once that's gone, the ice from the land comes in to the ocean and ice from land will raise sea level. And it may not matter to us so much yet. We can build more walls in Manhattan, Los Angeles, San Francisco, London, Paris, yeah. But what about people that did nothing to deserve this? this I know this family in the Maldives and they had to move house and they didn't do anything to deserve that. So we should think about it. So we formed my son and I, because I think it's really important that generations join together on these issues, uh, that I, the old warrior, would be out to try and preserve Antarctica, and my son would have a campaign to try and inspire young people who, ladies and gentlemen, today they're angry. They're upset with the world that they have inherited. And I think I would be too. But we can't just have angry young people. We've got to turn that uh, passion and anger and frustration into solutions. So my son Barney and I work on the preservation of Antarctica and the Climate Force Challenge. To do that, my son insisted that I joined him to walk to the South Pole again. I didn't really want to do it, but he convinced me to do it. And if I did it, I would have crossed personally the whole of the Antarctic landmass. So I thought, yeah, let's do it on renewable energy, which we did. And this was extraordinary. Uh, anybody listening, imagine throwing away your jet aviation fuel that you've used for years to melt ice and melt snow. And without water, you're dead in five days in Antarctica. So we threw that away 
and working with NASA created these extraordinary ice melters where through solar alone it melts the ice and snow and one day they'll use these on Mars. There's an idea. So off we went to the South Pole, my son and I and two companions and I was so excited to do this. And sadly, after 300 miles out of the 600 miles, my hip uh, disintegrates and I can't carry on. And this was a, a huge moment of failure for me. And I felt like I'd let everybody down. But Barney, my son, would carry on with Kyle and with Martin and his two companions. They fought on. Barney lost a bit of his toe, but he was willing to suck it up. And I was able to fly in and share his moment at the South Geographic Pole, nothing to do with me. And I just think it's so important today. I mentioned the word hope at the beginning, that all of us have exciting, great stories to inspire people, especially young people who are going through a pretty damn rough time now, and they can't really see anywhere outside sitting on Zoom. So this was a fantastic achievement by my son, first ever expedition to the pole or any pole, only on renewable energy. I thought, well, I can't leave it at that. So I got a brand new hip put in, went back this time last year to exactly where I left Barney at 300 uh, nautical miles from the pole. And this time I got the A team in, uh, Johanna and Katinka from Norway and Sweden. They are the preeminent uh, polar uh, travelers and I managed to convince them to come and lead me to the South Pole to get the job done uh, with our fantastic film and cameraman Kyle from Norway. Off we went again testing out different types of renewable energy because you know something if we use more renewable energy in the real world no one's going to go and exploit Antarctica because it won't make financial sense to do it. It'll be you on Wall Street that do the job. If it doesn't make financial sense, no one's going to go. So game on. So those last 300 miles, I thought I had it in the bag. This was just fantastic. I learned so much about leadership from Katinka and Johanna and got 97 miles from the pole. And I, I thought, I've got this after 1,460 miles on foot over 34 years of traveling, I thought I've got this. And I took my focus off, got out of the tent, fell over and my brand new hip went straight out of its socket. And I was left there feeling rather upset and um, got flown to the South Pole, got the hip put back in, but came back home and COVID struck and I thought, my God, you know, I can't just pack this in and uh, got some repairs done on the hip again, another few nuts and bolts. And, you know, I, I'm extremely proud uh, that Cameron Kerr is on this call because Cameron, I met in 2012, uh, just after his injury in Kandahar in South Afghanistan, he, he's from the 101st Airborne. And I saw this guy and I thought, wow. And he came on one of our ship expeditions, led that fantastically. And then I said, well, Cameron, how about trying this last few miles to the South Pole on the last degree? And this time last year, Cameron successfully reached the South Geographic Pole. It's hard enough doing it on two legs, never mind one. And he really, really inspired me to think maybe it would be really boring for me, the old warrior to sort of stick the flag in at the South Pole and say, job done. I thought, hang on, that's a bit dull. Why don't we get a team of wounded veterans, women and men, to come and join me to finish that journey, which um, with a much better story of resilience and courage, a much better story of hope. And in my humble opinion, why not have Wounded Veterans for the Antarctic. Uh, what a great story. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm reasonably irrelevant um, in the United States of America. I'm an Englishman for goodness sake. But imagine if Cameron, any of our team on the call here, get up and start talking about hope and resilience and uh, ESG and all those important things that we're combating. 
and at the same time saying, by the way, we should save Antarctica. Uh, that's why we're going to the South Pole all together. I thank you very much for listening to the story. All the very best. Hey, Rob, thank you so much for your inspiring comments. And to the audience, we have a question and answer uh, uh, thing you can click on. So if you have a question, please pose it and we'll do our best to get to them. You know, listening to your story, I'm beginning to have nightmares of my time in Quantico, Virginia, as a young Marine second lieutenant trying to find boxes during land navigation. I have no idea how you're able to find the South Pole um, based on the tools you had at the time. It's, that is just incredible. Um, with that, you mentioned Cameron and Cameron Kerr's story, uh, which is incredible. So I'd like to turn it over to Cameron. Cameron, if you could share your story uh, and, and your transition and would love to hear about your trip to the South Pole and of course, why you're going back. Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, so, I mean, a quick background, I guess, just to, to get to the fun stuff is I, I grew up just in a small town in Massachusetts and uh, always felt like I, I needed to earn my citizenship, which led me to join the army. And part of that was because um, my dad wasn't a citizen at the time. He's from Belfast, Northern Ireland. And so with him growing up in, in the ver veritable war zone of Belfast, um, back when he was a kid, around the same age that then I was, uh, that he had been when he was growing up there, I started realizing like, well, I'm so lucky to be a, uh, born, obviously just by sheer luck in the States. Um, and that ended up kind of leading, leading me on this trajectory to end up joining the army through ROTC, commissioning as an officer. Uh, and then as Rob said, ending up uh, in Southern Afghanistan and Kandahar, just be bopping around and, and trying to avoid IEDs uh, with a platoon of infantrymen uh, from 2010, or sorry, yeah, 2010, 2011. Um, I ended up having my bad day at work in February, 2011. Uh, while moving to assist a or check on a wounded Afghan who was my counterpart, I ended up uh, stepping on a, a pressure plate IED myself and uh, engaging in, I guess, what is known as the best and most effective way of, of losing weight fast. Um, I was medevaced that same day, obviously just on the, on the actual, uh, on the same medevac that I called for this other casualty. Um, and then next thing I know, I wake up uh, a few hours later with, with uh, no leg below my like the uh, mid calf essentially on my left leg um and i tried to stay active i tried to get into some stuff uh, at the well i did actually get into some stuff at the hospital and uh in the year or two uh initially afterwards and i linked up with rob like he talked about and went on this so we're having a massive windstorm so if my internet dumps out again that's that's the wind we had a transformer blow just recently um but anyways <laughs> if that happens uh, I went on this expedition to the peninsula, the Antarctic Peninsula with Rob in uh, 2012, as he said. And then um, uh, a few years go by and I, I was recontacted by Rob, as he mentioned in, uh, I think late 2018. And he had this crazy idea of, hey, do you wanna go to the South Pole? And I obviously said yes, because why would you say no to that? Um, and next thing I know, after about a year of uh, specialized gear acquisition and uh, some, some training in Norway, uh, in a remote part of Norway, I was being inserted, uh, via ski plane, uh, in the middle of the Antarctic plateau at two in the morning in broad daylight at about 9,000 feet, uh, with a team of about eight other people, I think. Um, and from there, I mean, it's, it's as Rob kind of talked about, and as, as you saw in the photos, it's one of the coldest, driest, most inhospitable places on earth. And it's like a alien planet, essentially. The best way to summarize it, I think Rob kind of touched on this too, is it's an entire continent that wants you dead. Um, and so we set out from 89 South, heading in a straight line with GPS, with all these modern uh, innovations that Rob didn't use, uh, essentially just heading to the pole, um, towing all our own gear, all our food, all our fuel, um, just everything that we had our, our entire lives in sleds behind us for about seven hours a day uh, over a flat, featureless, barren landscape. And if, if combat is anything, it's too much stimuli. And Antarctica is the opposite. Um, it, is, it is just nothing but butts in front of you. You're staring at butts and then people behind you um, going in a file and, and skiing until, uh, until you get a break for the day. But the ambient temperature there too uh, is about negative five Fahrenheit, but with wind chill, it was dropping down to negative 40, which is actually instantly where, where uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius meet up, which is kind of cool. 
um, below zero, obviously. And despite obviously being a little bit more frostbite proof than I used to be with two legs, uh, I still, I got some pretty bad frost nip on my nose and on, on uh, my, my fingers and my remaining toes, um, just to kind of give you an idea of the conditions, not to freak out anybody that's about to head there next January, but it's all 100% worth it. Um, but then anyways, after uh, eight days of skiing and camping, uh, on the 13th of January of 2020, we reached the South Geographic Pole, uh, which I think is special for a number of reasons. One of which it's, it's where all the lines on the map meet, which is a really cool thing. It's where the rotational axis of the earth uh, intersects the surface of the planet. Um, it's also this, uh, the furthest south that anybody on this planet could ever possibly go, aside from maybe if you're on the International Space Station and you happen to go over the, over the pole or something. Um, but for me, and I guess I think for everybody here who's veterans, I think one of the most special parts of the entire experience is just the, oh, of, of Antarctica actually as a whole, is the fact that it is the only place on earth. I mean, Rob, I'll back up and say, Rob talked about why it's special for a lot of other reasons. Um, and, and the fact that, yes, 90% of Earth's ice is there, 70% of Earth's fresh water. Uh, it is the last great wilderness on earth. But for us as veterans, I think it's particularly poignant because it's the last place on earth that's never been scarred by human conflict. Um, and for those of us that carry the visible and, and literal scars of war, it's the last place we haven't just <laughs> brought all our petty, fallible human quibbles and imported them into uh, an otherwise untouched wilderness. So when you're standing there at the at the South Pole, surrounded by the international flags fluttering in the wind, that that really resonates and it really hits home. Um, and so I know Rob's all about keeping it that way, as long as we're all alive. And I'm, I'm all about that as well. And I think anybody else who gets that experience to uh, to stand there and, and to witness that themselves, um, you, you can't help but have that. So um, I think that is best encapsulated, I guess, by uh, that, that famous quote from. Uh, I think he was then General Eisenhower before he was president talking about how, and I wrote it down so I don't mess it up. He says, I hate war as only a soldier who has lived it can and only as one who has seen its brutality, or brutality its futility and its stupidity. And like I said, that's, that's, that's what Antarctica for me is how it's so special and, and why we need to keep it the way it is. Um, but that I guess is the, the five, 10 minute summary of how I ended up going from being a, a young army officer in Kandahar to ending up at the South Pole, um, waiting for that plane ride out and, and uh, a nice warm shower. So I think, um, I think that's it, unless there was anything else that, that I, uh, I missed. Cameron, I thought that was perfect. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Lana, we'd like to turn to you next. Can you share uh, your story of transition and, and why you're heading off to the South Pole? Uh, sure. So, um, Background on me is that I uh, was growing up in New Jersey. I went to uh, college, got an engineering degree from Cornell, got my master's degree from the same and got a job and was incredibly bored uh, just doing engineering. I had wanted growing up to be an astronaut and this staring at blueprints while, um, you know, counting linear feet of drywall to estimate the cost of a major building was not exactly exploration and uh, interstellar travel. So I walked into my boss's office and told him that I was going to join the army and he laughed at me and that made me do it, uh, really prompted me to to do so. And I decided also that I was going to enlist despite having uh, my degrees. And because I really wanted to make sure that if I were to lead somebody that I had experienced what they did, I'm, I've always been very big on experiencing what, what I'm asking other people to go through. And uh, I got some of that delightful experience firsthand. Uh, I was in Afghanistan 
uh, before the before my first year of my enlistment was up, I was already on the ground and um, uh, dealing with riots and and all kinds of other fun things. And I was an intelligence collector and an interrogator, so I was primarily out with infantry and other combat troops looking for the bad guys with the bombs before the bombs went off. And then in Iraq, which I was in. Uh, actually, before my second year in the army was up, I was on now I'm deployment number two, and I ended up uh, finding one of those roadside bombs the hard way, um, or I suppose kind of the easy way, uh, because it found us, and uh, I ended up with a brain hemorrhage and a severe traumatic brain injury, which at the time was not being diagnosed. And so it took them another solid two and a half years before I was sent to Walter Reed for uh, brain surgery. And by then I also had nerve damage from a, an incident that had happened a couple of weeks prior to the explosion. And just a, a uh, series of unfortunate events that occurred, I ultimately ended up getting medically retired from the service uh, several, several years and assignments later. And transition was kind of awful. Um, it was not easy to come out as an enlisted, especially in a job that nobody knew or really could know what you had done or what you were doing. Uh, they uh, also, my degrees were about 10 years old at that point. So, you know, nobody was using, nobody was coding anything in, in C anymore. Super weird. Uh, and I, wandered around kind of lost a bit. And meanwhile, I'm still in pain. I'm still dealing with uh, migraines and I'm still dealing with a constantly dislocating and tearing ankle. And I started seeking help at various places and finally uh, found where I fit. And that was really my impetus to start saying like, well, where does everybody else fit? And how can I make sure that this isn't happening to other people? Um, and that's why I started, a, I started a company to help use artificial intelligence. Uh, I did in fact have to hire people I think we've lost Lana. Uh, Chanda, can you hear me okay? I sure can, Chris. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for her to come back, I will. Um, maybe we can turn it over to you, and and you can, um, you know, you can start sharing some of, of of your experiences. Let me see if I can. Okay, there we go. Um, when Lana comes back, we'll pick up. But maybe um, Chanda, you're the you're the best dressed of the team today for sure. Um, and we'd love to hear, I understand you've done, you did nine tours uh, in the Middle East. We'd love to hear your story, how you transitioned and, and your plans to go to the poll. So um, thank you, uh, Chris, and um, thank you to all for this, this opportunity. Um, I, you know, I, I, to start kind of like Alana and, and Cameron, um, my, my, my story goes back uh, quite a bit. My, my parents, my father's from uh, Eastern Africa and immigrated to the United States to come and uh, finish off his education. He became a uh, physician, along with my mother became a nurse um, at a time in America when uh, those opportunities are not afforded uh, to, um, to people of color. Uh, so when we grew up, my brother and I grew up in, in Los Angeles, uh, it was a, uh, we, we grew up in the school of hard knocks in the sense that you work for everything that you're given. Uh, you put your shoulder to the wheel just about every day and everything that you do and uh, nothing is free, but all of this is possible because of the I 
the idea of the United States of America. And so there's a plan for me. Uh, plan was to go to school in Boston and, and um, you know, as a, as a biology major to take over my father's practice one day. And uh, one day I was watching television um, during the summer in, in, in Boston and uh, saw a commercial with Army Rangers jumping out of airplanes. Uh, and uh, I was inspired uh, to do something a little bit different and uh, went to the ROTC office and joined ROTC. Um, and uh, to, to the chagrin of my family and, and to some of my friends uh, decided to embark on what, now that I look back on it, a selfish endeavor uh, to go and enjoy the, the, the spoils of being an infantry officer in the United States, in the United States Army. Um, so I, I ended up doing that and uh, did all the great things that you see in the commercials, jumped out of airplanes, right, deployed um, and, uh, and uh, deployed in combat zones and did some amazing things. I think when the mantle of selfishness um, shifts uh, when you become a commander um, and uh, combat tours as a commander, is, it takes its toll on you because uh, you're responsible for the lives of, of men and women uh, that are under your hand. And I, I unfortunately have lost numerous uh, soldiers uh, and uh, some to, you know, obviously for, for, for combat, from combat deaths, uh, but some too to horrific injuries that they are going to live with for the rest of their lives. And so one of the things that kept me in the army for so long was uh, inspired and solid leadership. Um, people that took care of families, people that took care of uh, individuals and, and, their, and their families and what they wanted to do next. And so uh, I, I looked back a couple times um, and said, okay, maybe it might be time to go back to the beaches of Los Angeles and figure out what I want to do myself. But ultimately I stayed in. And, uh, made the transition into uh, financial services, uh, probably because I, I, I had always followed the markets with my dad when I was younger. Um, there's, a, there's a longer story about the Atari and when I could play Atari when the markets closed, but I'll, I'll get to that to another day. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately I was, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get hired by Wells Fargo. That was a difficult transition. Um, and not difficult physically, difficult mentally, because for 20 years, you're so used to doing business a certain way. And uh, it, I, the difficulty was not needing to reinvent myself. Uh, the difficulty was um, stepping into the new normal of no longer waking up at 0530 to go to physical training, uh, no longer going on airplanes to specific parts of the United States or um, around the world for uh, combat deployments. Uh, you're getting your own pens and pencils and paper, right? You know, you know there's nobody doing stuff for you. You don't have a driver. Um, so, you know, you, you're, you're into this, this, this um, phase in life, um, and I called it halftime, where you really had to reinvent yourself and do something different when it came to understanding a new culture and financial services, um, understanding new process in my current job, uh, understanding protocol. And, you know, fortunately, I was blessed to be able to have a uh, core of, close friends and or um, bosses, uh, whether it's George Simonetti, Katie LaCroix, or my uh, very close friend, Angie Keene, these people putting their arms around you and saying, hey, listen, you can do this. Uh, you've just got to make sure that you put in the hard work to be able to get it done. All of these things that were hard as part of my transition, I had learned not only from my parents and growing up in the household that I did, but also, you know, the rigors of ranger school, the deployments, what you go through, you know, during these deployments prepared me mentally to make this difficult transition um, after halftime of my life uh, to join into financial services. While I do not have the physical scars as my, my undaunted uh, teammates, I certainly do live with the guilt of um, making a successful transition um, and uh, not being able to reach out to some of those that I've lost in the past or uh, those that are you know, still dealing with um, missing limbs or uh, burns, significant burns uh, throughout their body. Uh, so there's a significant toll that we, we still carry with us mentally. Uh, but the beauty about that is these hard things that we're about to embark on allow us to continue on because we've become so resilient over time uh, with the challenges that we're able to face. Um, I would like to end with this. That I think the untold beauty about this adventure is that veterans are going to partake in something you know pretty hard and if you look at the role of the united states military um, in the history of the united states uh, it has been the lead when it comes to change and championing championing change uh, for the better that has spread its tentacles across the world uh, whether it is the integration of uh, colored troops uh, whether it is now women in 
uh, maneuver roles as, as enlisted officers. Uh, and we now have the opportunity to be able to come together from all different walks of life across the spectrum uh, across the United States as veterans and show the world that we're capable of standing up for something that's pretty important and that will affect our future. So Chris, thank you very much, I appreciate it. No, thank you, Chanda. And, and for, the, for the veterans on the, uh, on the on line, I just wanted to call out some of the things that, that Chanda has done. Um, you know, I, I get to meet and know many, many veterans and Chanda's taken charge from the moment he transitioned and he started and he organized uh, a number of different initiatives down in Charlotte and is really championing along with Victor Perez of uh, the vast chapter in Charlotte. So thank you so much for that and all that you're giving back day after day to the community. Um, so, so we have Lana, you're back. Um, I was like on the edge of my chair as you're talking about your, your, how your leg was, was uh, dislocating and, and we lost you. So if you could pick up, uh, we'd really appreciate it. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and also now my cat wants to join in. She apparently was also on the edge of her seat. Um, so the, I was, you know, I was, I was trying to start, I was trying to start my own company to try and figure out what I could do to help everyone who was like me and struggling through transition, struggling to figure out where we fit, trying to manipulate all of these things. I mean, uh, China kind of talks about it in a slightly different way, but it's, it's like you, I looked at it more of a trial and error period. I was trying out, you know, I would try the VA or I would try another organization or I would try, and I couldn't figure out where I fit. And I wanted to figure out where, where do we fit in each thing? And, oh, wait, I need life insurance. I need health insurance. Like, what do I, how do I live without a uh, mother army helping me out? And, and, um, and meanwhile, I'm juggling all of these other things and the weight of injury. And so over time, I started, you know, I started a company and I started working in tech and, um, and I would walk to work. I would just walk across town in Manhattan and I would step off a curb. And because of the nerve damage that I had incurred and my leg injury, I would put my foot down wrong and roll it under me and tear two ligaments and be stuck in one of those immobilizing boots for another couple of weeks or some, some other event. I was probably tearing at least one piece of soft tissue twice a year for almost 14 years. And finally, I did it on a vacation and uh, so I'm sitting on a, now I'm sitting on a boat with my foot elevated and very clearly not in a good place. And I was like, that's it, I've had enough. And I went to a surgeon who agreed to work with me and with the VA and with uh, TRICARE to amputate my leg uh, 14 years or so after the explosion and after the accident that had preceded it that had initially broken and torn that ankle. And um, so I made that decision uh, on actually my 39th birthday is when I saw that doctor. And he was like, you've been doing this for how long? I am looking at this extra like I don't I don't know how you were walking on this to begin with and I was like oh yeah man I've been I've been like running and and hiking and I've climbed a couple of mountains uh in the interim I've got frostbite on that foot um and so that was about a year and a half ago and uh since since the amputation um I have, I'm almost at the point now where I can probably start doing a lot of like the hiking and stuff like that again, but I've also, I'm one of the very few in the US who have done a procedure called osseointegration where they did an implant into my 
shin bone to mount the uh, prosthesis. So unlike Cameron, uh, I don't have a socket, a fitted socket that you typically think of. Um, so now that uh, Chris and, and Rob and, uh, and some of the other folks reached out and said, hey, do you wanna do this South Pole thing? By the way, uh, it might be like negative 40 degrees. It was, um, I had to contact the surgeon and be like, hey, has anybody done this before? So, and the answer by the way is no, uh, not with osseo integration. So uh, we're now negotiating the joys of uh, what do I need a special foot so that I can, I have been, do I have uh, enough insulation around the point where the metal meets the skin that it's not going to chafe everything off. And um, so, you know, it's another great adventure, I think. Um, and I think it's definitely worth it because uh, it's, it's truly untouched land and I remember staring out at one point uh, actually right after I uh, broke the foot in Iraq and I'm standing there staring out at just an expanse of desert and remember thinking like this is but it's so flat and it's so blank and there's just nothing there and I remember thinking like you know this is it's beautiful how untouched it is. It has no idea what's going on right across this highway that, you know, there's uh, explosions and war and, and people who want you dead. Um, and, you know, now I would be able to go to a land that's truly untouched and truly without war or combat. And it has no idea of the drama that we're causing on the other six continents. And there's something so peaceful about being able to stare out at that, that I'm, I've been looking for since I got out of the service and I, I haven't been able to find, and I'm looking forward to this a lot. So thank you. No, thank you for sharing your story. It's incredible. Uh, last but not least, uh, my, my dear friend, Sunny Lee. Sunny, would you share your story and of transition and, and why you're going to the South Pole? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, just if I could lace in this, the concept of resilience into my response about transition, because I think it's relevant here. Uh, just, just growing up and just I think I saw a lot of resilient people, not just necessarily in war and combat, but I mean, really my family raising three kids, my parents raising three kids running fast food Chinese restaurants. Um, and then I studied it a little bit academically, of course, because I um, was in the Marine Corps and I was interested in things like that. Um, but a personal view of mine, it's, it's kind of like a fleeting concept, right? It's, it's elusive, like everyone has their journey with it and they're just constantly chasing it. Uh, it's very hard for me to say, for example, uh, like somebody is gonna be universally resilient. Um, in other words, if I throw like uh, just the right mixture of pain, confusion, among other things uh, into that, and it's very difficult for me to say that that, perfect, that that person, regardless of how resilient they are, they're gonna be able to handle it. Such is the case with my transition. Um, I really fancied myself as a, as a resilient human being with, with multiple combat deployments, uh, injuries, uh, and, and seeing some things that, that normal people probably just shouldn't see. Uh, but outside of that, like you figure that I would have a, somebody like me with my background would have a smooth transition. But, you know, when I think about the actual transition, uh, the first things that really come to mind are it's nothing good, like, uh, like an extreme lack of direction, uh, aimlessness, uh, a degree of loneliness, uh, depression, if, if I may, and then and then a couple all those things with a very real inability to ask for help, just because you're programmed that way. And and so um, now the second part of your question, Chris, uh, about about Antarctica, um, outside of the actual expedition, which I think is, is be incredible, 
I mean, to be a part of Rob's story, um, who's was focused on ESG before before e ESG really became a hot thing in, in, in popular culture. That's 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 amazing to 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 see you know hear the stories of resilience from the separate panelists, and we all have different stories. I'm excited to share mine as an Asian American, but I'm really more excited to hear everyone else's story. Um, that's all I got. Thank you, sir. And if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and type away. Uh, in the meantime, Rob, can you talk about what goes into to this type of expedition? Can you talk through the logistics and the planning and the costs? Well, <clears throat> sadly, uh, everybody, you can't pick a more expensive place to go anywhere on the planet. And that's actually quite good uh, in my book because it, uh, it can't just go there for the weekend. But just to give you an idea of, of logistics, Chris, you know, a, a 45 gallon drum of fuel in South America might be 150 bucks. That same barrel transported the whole way to the South Pole, that same barrel, if you wanted to buy it, would be 28,000 US dollars. So this is, you know, a massive, massive logistical place. And we're lucky, and I helped set this up, 33 years ago, uh, we're lucky to work with a team of people who fly in a very small operation to Antarctica and they have a base camp which when you first go there you think yuck and then when you come back from the South Pole it's like going to the Ritz, you know, it's, oh. um, it's nothing fancy but they have this base camp and then you, so you fly in from Punta Arenas in Chile, land on the ice, which is a huge thing because when, when you imagine landing with an aeroplane that's got skis on it, the, the plane would never make it to the Antarctic because there'd be too much drag underneath. So you have to land on wheels. And that's something we pioneered 30 odd years ago where we took off from South America, Punta Arenas, and we knew there was an area of ice there that we could land on. The only problem was if it snowed over while we were on the way and no GPS, no Google Maps, we would have, well, I wouldn't be talking to you now, but that, that we land on these ice runways that are a bit bumpy, but it's very safe. And then we get onto a smaller plane, which actually for anybody who knows about planes is my favorite airplane, the, an old DC-3, which is refurbished, fantastic airplane. So when you're sitting in it, you're at this angle. Um, Cameron's been on board and we fly to 89 South, get off the plane and then it hits you. Plane's gone, no more noise. And you know, you've got 15,000 feet of ice beneath you and it's time to get on with it. And I think one thing that people uh, don't really mention much about polar travel is that the actual walkings, it's okay actually, you have an hour, every hour you stop, you have chocolate. Um, and the good thing about South Pole to travel is that no one has to be on a diet. You can eat exactly what you want as much as you want all the time, um, Cameron would agree. And, but you've got to obviously live in a tent. So there's a huge amount of systems to do with logistics. You've got to know how to put the damn thing up because it's not the time to take your gloves off and get frostbite. So you've got to be well proficient as any military people would be at systems. And what's really good about uh, uh, the, the journey is that because it's always sun, and the sun never goes down, that outside it's really, really cold. But once you get the tent up, the sunlight comes through the tent fabric and actually, well, it's not warm, but it's not freezing. So it would be, I don't know, 35, 40 degrees in there on 40. a good day. And that, that feels really, really warm, which is great, isn't it, Cam? Yeah, 40 degrees feels nice there. 40, 40 degrees feels really good inside the tent. And obviously you're sleeping the night, you uh, mainly um, have dehydrated food. Uh, and you, it, what we do, which is really nice, is that we have one tent that we dig out a big hole every evening. And then everybody on the team can go into that tent 
and sits on a sort of ice ledge. Um, and that's really special uh, because everybody can, can join together. So it's a massive logistics thing. The actual equipment that you take, you've got to damn well carry it. So, you know, there's no sort of, there's nothing fancy there. Anybody, obviously military people have carried stuff. You don't carry anything you don't want. So it's quite lean down logistically. And the costs of doing this are you know, very expensive. So when we're raising money for each one of our um, team members, we're looking at you know, close on 90,000 US dollars to make this happen. And that's a stack load of money, but I believe it's worth every cent to give people a fantastic story to inspire others with. And I think at this time, especially, you know, I said it in my talk, people need hope, Chris. And I think doing this is very hopeful because it's like we haven't messed on Antarctica. There is no damn COVID-19 at the South Pole, by the way. It would, <laughs> you know, it would freeze, um, which is great. So I think it's a very hopeful message. It is very expensive. But um, working with MOVE um, United, um, you know, it, it, it's all coming together bit by bit. Yeah, so uh, Rob, just wanted to point out, you mentioned the cost. Uh, we, the, this is, uh, we're raising money through charity and the, the organization that we're partnering with is MOVE United. Um, so if anyone's interested in supporting other companies, um, we can share the link uh, in a subsequent uh, release and we'll put it on, on social media. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about how we can go about, how people can go about tracking the journey. And maybe I can start by taking this one. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. We learned this after the fact that we were, many of us were embedded with the same guy. Uh, his name was Lucian Reed. Uh, he recently published a book, all of which I saw. He was embedded in, uh, across for, for a couple of years, actually, across I Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, when we decided to put this together, we knew it had to be documented because the story, I think, is good, could inspire generations um, based on the way we're bringing different people together to do something really difficult and obviously capture uh, Rob's story. Uh, when I called Lucian, he was uh, in the Bering Sea filming The Deadliest Catch, and he said, Chris, there's two things that I love. I love veterans and I love polar exploration. I'm in. Uh, so Lucian is going to be, uh, he subsequently, when he came back from Iraq, became an Emmy award winning uh, cinematographer, director, producer, etc. So he's going to be documenting the journey. Uh, we're working with a couple of social media outlets on being able to update folks on the progress. And so ultimately, after the team is successful in reaching the South Pole, um, we're hoping to, to release a, a documentary that captures the stories of, of the veterans you've heard from today. Uh, along with their with their journey to the South Pole, so so that's that question. Um, let me see here. Next question, uh, Cameron. Do you have any tips uh, for people trying to head to the South Pole? What did you learn? What didn't you expect? And uh, what would you tell the, your fellow teammates? I think, like Rob was was referencing just a few minutes ago, the systems is the most important thing. A lot of people stress about training and uh somebody the other day was asking about like oh what heart rate zone should i be in for training and all that's good but it's not as essential as having your systems down so that when you take those gloves off you have like the countdown starts you have a, a few minutes at most before you need to get those hands back in gloves multiple layers of gloves liners mid-level gloves and then like the big fat outer ones um before you might have actual serious issues because the wind will just whip any body heat away in seconds. So that's where the systems come in place um, just to, to streamline things. And like Rob said, we, we do that pretty well in the military. When you get your SOPs down, you get your, um, just all the little nuances of say being a combat or just even garrison life, um, all the stuff that just becomes muscle memory. You, you, you have to train to do that. I know we're doing that later this year uh, I think in California at, at right, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare School, um, <clears throat> which would be essential. Um, but otherwise, I think I might have talked about it before, but it's, it's not as much the physical, but the psychological and uh, just the fact that there's like no stimuli and there's nothing around you. There's no points of reference. There's no terrain features. There's just, it's nothing. And so 
I used the, the last time in, in January last year as a time to reflect. And I, I used it as kind of a meditative experience. I didn't bring any, uh, what's the word, podcasts or books on tape. Um, I, I will probably do that this time. I'll put it that way. <laughs> because after a certain amount, you can only meditate so much while skiing. You can only think about things so much when you're skiing. And after, uh, like I said, after eight days, it's a bit much. So I think it's good because it's absolutely a once in a lifetime experience. And, and um, very few people at all in human history will go to Antarctica, even fewer were actually ski to the pole. And so I was trying to take uh, as much advantage of that experience and, and just absorb as much of it as possible. Um, but I would, yeah, I would definitely bring some, uh, some books on tape for this next time. Yeah, here's one for Rob. Um, clearly the, the elements are, are a dangerous part of the journey. Is there anything else dangerous that, to be aware of, dangerous wildlife or anything else? No, so at the South Pole, there's nothing. No wildlife, uh, nothing. One, you're one mile in from the edge of Antarctica, there's nothing. Uh, all the wildlife is on the edge of Antarctica, on, in the ocean there. Uh, there's no crevasses, which is really important for the team. There's no crevasses at the South Pole where we go. Uh, they, they're 500 miles uh, on the outside uh, of, the, uh, of the Antarctic. And I think the, I think the, 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 the most dangerous thing, and I, I would like to recognize him very quickly, you know, Michael Collins, the astronaut, uh, died the uh, day before yesterday. And, you know, there he was while Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were on the moon doing their stuff. You know, he was circling around in an orbit and, you know, no one's really ever talked about him an awful lot. But, you know, his, if he got it all wrong, it, the whole thing would have been a complete disaster. You know, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong would have kind of stayed on the moon for the rest of their, while the oxygen lasts. And I think one of the things that people can make a mistake on is not actually relying on each other. And every single person, as Cam will tell you, it doesn't matter how tough you are, Everybody has a bloody awful day, excuse the language, walking to the South Pole. It will happen. There is no question. It's there. And I think that that sense of, you know, not being British, stiff up the lip, which I kind of lost that a long time ago, uh, and really relying on each other. I think that's something that, that people eventually get right. But I'm sure as military people, you know that. Uh, and... Uh, I think that really does help and not forgetting that and sharing where you are and how good or how bad it is. I think that's something that you haven't got time to mess around with that. You need to start that on day one. Would you agree, Cam? Absolutely. Yeah. Rob, what's the highest elevation someone asked? Yeah, the highest elevation at the South Pole is uh, about 10,000 feet above sea level. But because of where you are on the face of the planet, that and the pressures and the ionosphere and stuff, you can, on your body, sometimes experience 12,000. I think on one day, 14,000. But really, the average is about 10,000, uh, which is quite high to fly into. And that's something that um, you know, we, we take into consideration in the first couple of days. We ease into the journey to allow people to get get over any altitude problems. Thanks. And last question, someone asked, how can they help support the Undaunted team? Well, Rob, you want to take that? Well, I think two things, really. One is thank you. Um, and I think part of this is possibly to look. We've got all of us have got fantastic stories. You've just heard them, for goodness sake. Um, and I think all of us in it's not really uh, how can you support us, it's how can we support you? Because I think if anybody supports us, they should plan, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, when we can actually can see people again, you know, get us in to come and speak. You know, we could talk about leadership, teamwork, resilience, we can talk about ESG, all those important things about you know, companies and businesses. And I think that's something anybody who would like to possibly help us Think about that because we want to give something back. And I think selfishly, if we give a lot back, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we get a bit more help. So we're all in 
in the ring to be able to give back to anybody who very kindly uh, might support us. And we have, all of us jointly, a fantastic story of hope and resilience. Thanks, Rob. Any other thoughts from the team members? No? Okay, uh, with that, let's uh, let's end the, the chat. I hope everyone enjoyed. I mean, I certainly did. I thought, uh, thank you for the panelists for sharing their incredible stories. Uh, wishing everyone the utmost success, uh, and we know you're going to be you're going to be successful in reaching the South Pole. So, have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and thanks again. Thanks, team. Thanks, Chris. Take care, everybody. Thanks, and thanks for joining thanks, us. Have a good weekend. Bye. Take care.